What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and this is Block Digest episode 220 at block height 630,627th on uh, Saturday, May 16th. Got that all right. Numbers. I, I got my numbers straight in my head today, guys. So how, how's it going today, Jimmy? Uh, Pretty good. I mean, all I have to say about the... Uh fun stuff that's been happening over the last day or so is that bitcoin slash harry potter slash occupy mars is not the crossover fan fiction that we asked for but maybe it's the one we deserve yeah probably but yeah it's uh it's the happening the happening happened oh my god the mining death spiral all the miners are dead where'd the miners go are we still getting blocks uh, looks like it to me. In fact, um, I mean, I haven't checked whether it dipped down again. I think it might have, but we actually got an all-time high hash rate um, around the time of the halving. Mm. I think, you know, kind of fun, I think. You know, especially, I, you know, you and me, I don't know who's listening to this, uh, listens to the other thing, but, you know, we dropped by uh, the Tales from the, the Crypt live stream for that. That was pretty fun. Uh Wang Chun actually did a pretty cool live stream. It was him and a couple miners from China and then Lop and uh, Luke. But is you know, as much as there was cool things like that, I I cringe inside looking at some of the big brand name like having events that happened. Yeah, ours was ours was pretty weird. Went from topic to topic and at one point, as you may have seen on Twitter, uh as I mentioned on Twitter, uh, I was apparently, my bunker, my bunker in quotes, was threatened with a visit by Peter McCormick in his surveillance dystopia Lambo that he's going to buy when Bitcoin goes to 100,000. He realizes that all you have to do to destroy Lambos is put speed bumps places, right? Well, yes, that was part of the joke. <laughs> that, that is, in fact, why, and that's why he threatened to come, because uh, we mentioned that the roads were too narrow um, where he comes from to even drive a Lambo around, as I know by experience. Um, but, yeah. yeah. I think I, I missed that uh, part of the stream. That was when I ducked out to go get uh, stuff to make tacos. Yeah, so it basically went like this. He said that if Bitcoin went to 100k that he would buy a Lambo because fuck it. And then a bunch of us were like, wait a second, but the UK has curbs and they also have very narrow roads that barely even one car can go down. So how are you going to do that? And then he threatened to come visit my bunker. Quotes bunker. So Peter McCormick threatens to spend money on silly things. <laughs> Yes, but actually the most um, the most entertaining way to sorry if anyone can hear the um, children who are breaking the lockdown rules <laughs> right now. Um, actually, the most entertaining way to stop a self driving car. I don't know if Lambos do self driving stuff, but if it does, the most entertaining way possibly to stop a self driving car is to uh, draw um, road signs like the you know double line dash line whatever i'm not a driver i don't know these things but basically trap the car in a circle of road lines so it can't escape that's the most fun this is how magic becomes real yes the article that detailed it called it a pagan ritual which is funny apparently anything to do with magic is pagan mm -hmm. all righty though guess you want to just uh kind of dive right into it yeah, so um, block 630,000 was mined on May 11th at around 9.23 p.m. GMT plus two. 
Uh, but the most interesting thing about the event was the message that was added to the Coinbase data on the halving block. Uh, if you may recall, Bitcoin's Genesis block included the following message in the Coinbase parameter, quote, the Times, January 3rd, 2009, Chancellor on brink of second, second bailout for banks. This was the title of a Times article about the UK Chancellor, Chancellor Alistair Darling being forced to consider a second bailout for banks as, as the lending drought worsens in in the 2008-2009 financial crisis um and then about the article was about how the chancellor will decide within weeks whether to pump billions more into the economy um options include cash injections offering banks cheaper state guarantees to raise money privately or buying up toxic assets and then meanwhile in the coinbase data for this having block there is the following message ny times april 9th 2020 with $2.3 trillion injection, Fed's plan far exceeds 28 rescue, 2008 rescue. Um, and the top of the article states, uh, of that article from the New York Times says, the Federal Reserve said it would buy some municipal bonds and some riskier debt to help governments and companies. Um, yeah, so that's cool. It's kind of a callback to the Genesis block. And uh, it was F2 pool that mined that block. So that is a badass move to do at do that because it basically reminds us that in the decades since Bitcoin was launched, the old system hasn't changed a bit, and if it has changed, it's been for the worse. Yeah, that was pretty cool, I think, that uh, F2 Pool was able to find that block. And, you know, honestly, like, he, he was going um, for the actual first post happening block. Um, I think that's what a lot of people uh, spamming messages were going for. I honestly kind of find it a little more fitting this way in the last b block from the previous era. Like that that was the end of something and th that was the event or the the thing that is going to shape what comes after it. You know what I mean? Yeah, and um I don't know if you saw it, but did you see what message was included in the block after the having block? Um I don't know which specific one you're talking about. I, re I remember Nick Carter um, actually had like a list of a bunch of different messages that uh, like non-miners um, time stamped into um, blocks around the heaven. Well, I did not uh, check and verify this, but I heard people saying that the block after the having block um, included the message Epstein didn't kill himself. <laughs> ah. Yes, that one. Yes, that does. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't catch Corona either. Yeah, definitely didn't do that. But yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I don't know, it's kind of anticlimactic, you know, because you've seen this before. But, you know, it's, it's a demarcation point. Like, that was an arbitrary line that people are going to look back on and assign significance to it, even if, uh, you know, right now I'm just thinking back to the computer screen I was staring at like normal. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, um, not everyone had a good having day because uh, for anyone who's listened to us for a while, you know that we're not fans of shitcoin telegraph and apparently neither is YouTube because just before the having, they ran into a bit of a problem with their live stream they had planned. Um, their article is titled YouTube cancels coin telegraph BTC having live stream for being quote harmful content. Um, the article says coin telegraph had a full day of programming lined up for a live stream that covered Bitcoin's third block having on May 11th. The agenda mostly went off without a hitch. FinTech luminaries like Tim Japer, Roger Ver, wait, Roger Ver, wait, why would he, <laughs> why would he be celebrating Bitcoin having? Anyway, Meltem, Demur, and many more shared their time and opinions with Cointelegraph editorial staff over the course of a live stream that lasted just under seven hours. But the stream was blocked and deleted six hours and 42 minutes into a nearly finished program, locking more than 2,000 viewers out of our coverage. YouTube is notorious for bans and censorship of crypto-related content, and it's driven a number of crypto content creators to competing platforms that operate on decentralized principles. Well, I don't know about that. They definitely have gone to other platforms. Whether they're decentralized is debatable. 
Uh, the specific reason given for terminating the video feed is that our block having coverage was, quote, harmful or dangerous content that violated YouTube's community policy. Uh, yeah. Um, don't agree with YouTube censorship because it's been affecting a lot of other people that actually create quality content and don't deserve that. But then again, it's YouTube. It's owned by Google. They have corporate policies that aren't going to align with your free speech for all. And yeah, that's going to happen. Um, John Carvalho commented, quote, imagine having Roger Ver on your Bitcoin having show. Then imagine the headspace of Roger Ver being on a Bitcoin having show. Dark. And I agree with that because that definitely sounds like uh, for, for mature audiences only type content. Think of the babies. But yeah, I mean, it's I, I, I'm torn between laughing um, <laughs> at how hilarious that is because Cointelegraph is a shit stained rag. Uh, but yeah, um, like I, I think we're probably going to see a lot more of that stuff, especially now that the. Uh, you know, they have this excuse they can pull out of a hat at any moment. Um, our support staff aren't working because you can't do that from home for some reason. So we'll get around to looking at it. Sorry. And that is all. All right. Sorry about that. Mm hmm. Just launched an ICO while you were gone. No! You got my founder's reward for me, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Actually, no. I, I decided to no! I decided to give it I decided to give it to uh Rick's Ginny Weasley. No Cause you know, she's uh got that name. Oh man. It's gonna be fun thinking about what to replace that silence with later. <laughs> Alrighty, so, uh, yeah, uh, mini script. I'm gonna show a thing again because it's an awesome thing. Uh, so Magical Bitcoin, um, the project, uh, by Aleko Spaliki, I hope I'm not butchering that name, um, dropped a new thingy. I mean, so at least you didn't say Guacamo Zuko. Actually said that before. Is that a thing? Guacamole. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, but um, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Aleko has dropped uh, a new thing on the site here. Um, a playground for mini script. Um, and it's it's a graphical playground. So for anybody who is unaware, there is this programming language called Scratch that MIT developed uh, years ago. And the whole idea behind it is that you, you condense variables and functions and the, dif the different control structures in the language into literal Lego blocks um, that you can just drag and drop to construct a program out of a as a way to ease uh, young children into the, the kind of conceptual meat of programming and what you're doing there. And Alikos created one of these for Miniscript. Um, so you can literally go on the site um, and there are some examples um, of pre-constructed uh, scripts as well as just uh, the individual pieces to build your own. And you can just start playing around with composing your own custom script constructs. And th this is fucking awesome. Um, and not just for developers or, or people who are trying to build things in this space, but the, the entire idea of a scratch for Bitcoin script, uh, that, that's the inevitable end goal of building all of these higher level languages like Miniscript that compile down to actual raw script it's abstracting up so that less and less technical people can actually interact with and, and use th this kind of functionality in a way they can understand and you know i'm looking at this and i'm not just thinking a playground um 
where the geekier people in this space can play around with their own custom script structures. I'm thinking a tab in a wallet where a normie can wrap their head around creating um, some specific custom addresses in their wallet that use custom scripts and being able to actually put together some degree of, of complicated script beyond this one public key, check a signature against it um, for normal use in Bitcoin. And it's like, you know, I, 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 I spent a little bit of time the other day as a little drunk <laughs> and I DM'd uh, a like us to pick his brain on this. Just and a little. Like, just a little. But um, yeah, I, I am going to be shilling the living shit out of this site and project every time they drop something from this point on because this is this is exactly the kind of reference point and common pool that that needs to, to be in this space for wallet developers, for just just everybody to kind of slowly get on the same page of there is a lot of crazy complicated things you can do on this protocol. So how do we get it all in one, one place that any wallet developer can understand and, and choose what they want to use in their project, but also how can we abstract the more complicated side of this to the point that a normal user can get their head around it and, and actually get some value out of it. So Alikos, Magical Bitcoin, this is the shit. You left out guacamole. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, this is really fucking cool. I mean, it's, this is the kind of stuff, like, it, it boggles my mind in this space how much attention is devoted to things like explaining Bitcoin to J.K. Rowling, but not two things like this and it's, it's, it's come on guys pay pay attention to the important things here fight the voldy bucks all right so we want to just slide into the next one yep so um ruben Sampson is at it again he has dropped a proposal for a succinct uh atomic swap and it's kind of an interesting idea. Um, so pretty much it, it is a way to lift um, part of the finalization of an atomic swap off chain and enforce that in, in the same kind of reactive way um, that, that you enforce the current state in a, in a lightning channel. So like just have the transactions set up to actually on chain finalize an atomic swap um but watch the chain with that in, in a reactive way so that you can effectively transfer custody without actually confirming all of these things on chain and so pr pretty much the the idea is to kind of create a a lockup um on the initiating side um where there is a pre-image involved in taking that money back so refunding it and the initial side sets this up and on the other chain that you're swapping between the other side sets something similar up and the the idea is here that from these two outputs you have a pre-signed transaction um kind of like a commitment transaction um in a lightning channel and this commits money to a key um with two potential pre-signed transactions um that are time locked and either refund or allow the other side of the party to successfully um just claim the atomic swap on their own and you know the the general gist of of what's going on here is you can just set this up and then exchange the, the secrets between the two parties that are doing the atomic swap. And then it's this, it's the same kind of logic as the lightning network. Like you, you haven't physically moved on chain these coins to a UTXO that only you can control. But if you have a watchtower watching the chain um, with the appropriate transactions, once that those pre-images are passed off chain, you effectively have transferred control of those coins. Um, 
And so it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. And it really has me thinking a lot about really how important watchtowers are going to be. Um, because this is by no means the, uh, the first thing, um, aside from the lightning network, kind of looking at watchtowers and that kind of reactive security model on chain. Um, you know, Brian Bishop's, um, vault proposal, um, using pre-signed transactions. Um, it is the exact same thing. It's a reactive model where you are assuming there is a watchtower, um, monitoring the chain to react to something that would occur in the appropriate way. And, you know, I, I really don't think that that infrastructure by any means is, is going to be limited to lightning. Like, I, I think at this point, it's very clear that is going to be a general purpose piece of network infrastructure that is supporting and providing that function for all kinds of protocols or services beyond just the lightning network. And so, yeah, it's, it's something to think about in terms of just the, the trust dynamic of that, if you aren't running it yourself. And then also the, the scaling issues of that, um, as far as how many different types of services are trying to use a single watchtower. And I know that's kind of a, a little bit away from the, the core um, swap protocol that he's proposed. But you know, I, th I think it's a, a very interesting idea because this does have the same kind of trade-off that a lightning channel does versus on-chain. You are moving to that slightly reduced security model requiring reactive um, attention and action to protect your money. But that might be worth it to a lot of people in a very high fee um, you know, environment if block space becomes very scarce. And so it's, it's just an interesting thing to look at that even very old protocols like this uh, regarding things like atomic swaps across chains um, there are still ways you can kind of improve that and and make that work a little better in those types of high pressure environments. And I think it's pretty cool. You know, Ruben's not even a developer and he has just been knocking out, um, you know, protocol proposals. Like he has developed the, the state chain, like payment channel construct, um, a new idea for merge mining um, side chains with different trade offs and dynamics. And now this, like it's, we're, we're really getting into that, that Bitcoin renaissance period, I think, where there's so much stuff going on in terms of ideas and proposals. It, it's a little hectic to keep up with it. And that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think that is you up next, Jenny. Oh, yes. Prepare for some ranty panties and a twist. So... While Shinobi and I were busy being freaks on the Tales of the Crypt having party, I noticed that Amy Castor via Decrypt had published an article that pulled quotes from Balaji Surinavasan, the ex-CTO of Coinbase, after he spoke during Coindesk's uh, consensus distributed conference, which I didn't even know was going on because I don't care. Um, the article is titled X Coinbase CTO, Government Surveillance is a Necessary Evil. So yeah, take a deep breath, everyone, because this is going to be a long one. In the article summary, uh, it says, Balaji has been relentlessly tweeting about the new coronavirus since January. He is in favor of decentralization, but he is also a pragmatist, he said, and he believes aggressive testing and tracing requires surveillance. So in the interview, um, or at least the quotes that they pulled um, in a kind of interview format. He goes on to say that um, this is something for which the government of South Korea has been applauded. That is only because the country accepts a heavy use of surveillance technology, notably CCTV, and the tracking of bank cards and mobile phone usage. More liberal countries, such as the U.S., may be less willing to accept these types of measures, end quote. Hmm. I wonder why. I wonder why more liberal countries are less willing to surrender their privacy to the government so that their speech and social activity can be controlled. 
Can you put your finger on it, Shinobi? Wasn't there that thing with that guy about seven years ago that not only showed how extensively the U.S. government was invading our lives, but that all of the surveillance had little to no value in terms of solving actual crime and instead uh, weaponized sociopolitical uh, powers to manipulate us domestically and in foreign policy? You know, I think we should forget about all that because it's been seven years, right? Surely they've learned their lesson by now. What's that, Lassie? The U.S. Senate is voting to reauthorize the Patriot Act and give law enforcement agencies access to web browsing data without a warrant, dramatically expanding the government's surveillance powers. All right. Oops. Um, then the kicker in the interview, he uh, and he doesn't see a quick blockchain fix to the problem. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, what a relief because, you know, instead of paying some Silicon Valley dipshit thousands of dollars to build a state-of-the-art healthcare location tracking DLT solution, he helped enable millions of dollars to be funneled to former hacking team management for doing good old blockchain surveillance. Bad choice. Yeah. Um, when this first started, I actually had a little bit of respect for Balaji because he was bringing a bit of common sense to analyzing the science of this situation. But as far as all the shit that he has been talking in terms of response or policy or what we need to do as a society, he's lost his goddamn mind. Like, I don't give a shit if the bubonic plague is sweeping this country again. Like, no. I am not bending over and giving permission to surveil every aspect of my life to judge whether I am a model citizen or not. Get fucked. I will never give my permission for that. I don't care what the fuck is going on. That is a foundational principle of these liberal countries. Of a place like America. And I don't care how out of line the actual government is with those principles. I am not going to give them permission to be that out of line. Fuck that. Yeah, so uh, it gets even better. Um, he is also quoted as saying, it is easy to get a centralized solution up and working in a short period of time in a pandemic and an emergency, and the surveillance apparatus is already in place. The NSA is already surveilling Americans, said Sir Navasan, and has been since at least 2014. That must be a major typo, or he's in even bigger idiot than I thought. Um, that was after NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden exposed the agency's data collection tactics. So at least we should get some benefit out of that, he said. We should get some benefit out of that. We should get some benefit out of the decades of illegal mass surveillance programs that were exposed as ineffective and unconstitutional. We should get some benefit out of a literal international conspiracy of nation states to route around their own domestic due process and privacy laws to subvert human rights, mislead the public into endless wars that only benefit their political dominance in the military industrial complex. And we should get some benefit out of that because this system was designed to do something other than benefit the common good for people like us and it would never benefit us um he also argued that the key is not to position contact tracing as a bad choice in a vacuum instead the public ought to consider it a less bad choice given the spectrum of bad choices that are available oh yes the tired old lesser evil argument that's currently being bludgeoned into the heads of anyone who doesn't feel like voting for the blue sexual predator stormtrooper, because God forbid if the red sexual predator stormtrooper stays in office, even though we're perfectly willing to give him more executive power and expand the surveillance state. Yeah, of course, that's not weird at all. Um, and then he says, it's basically like fighting a war, he said. Once you are in peacetime, you can hopefully back off on these kinds of policies, end quote. Oh, what's that, Lassie? Oh, yeah. The Patriot Act was signed into law in 2001 in response to September 11th. And even though the U.S. has officially withdrawn from Iraq which they wrongfully invaded and occupied for a decade, somehow the Patriot Act is not only still around, 
but we are apparently reauthorizing it, and your so-called representatives are allowing it to be revised into something even worse. Uh, and then Yans, yeah. Once we are in peacetime, you can hopefully back off. Um, yeah, once we are in peacetime, as if they hasn't they haven't been postponing peacetime indefinitely for as long as I can remember, because in the words of George Orwell, Oceana was at war with East Asia. Oceana has always been at war with East Asia. So when exactly are they going to back off? That is the big question. Yeah, I mean, dude, like, come on. Dude, You th- eventually you won't have to choose between getting groped or getting a small dose of radiation anytime you travel. Just, just go with it. Just go with it for a little while. It's okay. Like, just we, we need to do this, guys. It's for the greater good. Yeah, and uh, this thing keeps on going. So uh, also the article states, he didn't spell out how cryptocurrency would help people backtrack from heavy surveillance, however, but then again, it was a short interview, end quote. And that's the last quote I'm going to say from the article. And yeah, so Balaji can keep the rest of his naive thoughts to himself, and I will bring up some counterpoints that dispute all of this garbage. Um, But yeah, keep in mind, this guy was the CTO of Coinbase until last year, May 2019. You know, the CTO is supposed to be responsible for the, you know, technical roadmap of the company and, you know, sometimes can deal with security stuff as well. Um, so for those of you who are still using Coinbase, how does it feel that this guy had access to your personal information? I wouldn't feel good. Um, but anyway, counterexamples. Uh, there was a study published on May 13th with authors from MIT and Cornell University on, quote, Americans' perceptions of privacy and surveillance in the COVID-19 pandemic, which found, quote, widespread reluctance among the public, support for contact tracing apps is lower than for expanding traditional contact tracing or introducing new measures like temperature checks and centralized quarantine using a uh, con- using a conjoint analysis experiment embedded in the survey we find that privacy preserving features including non-location tracking and decentralized data storage increase the public's acceptance of contract tracing apps um, there was another study published on the same day by authors from Johns Hopkins University Microsoft Research and the University of Zurich titled how good is good enough for contact or how good is good enough for COVID-19 apps the influence of benefits accuracy and privacy unwillingness to adopt Um, and they found that if contact tracing app if a contact tracing app were to exist that was perfectly accurate perfectly and perfectly private up to 88 percent of americans would be willing to install it Now, you may be thinking, wow, that's a really high percentage. But then when they were asked uh, whether they would install it, if there was any chance of errors in accuracy, privacy, or both, it dropped to about 20 to 30 percent who were giving it the green light, with 70 to 80 percent who were either uncertain or said outright no. Uh, Furthermore, if there was a possibility that the data could leak to their employer, willingness was at 27 percent. Uh, to the U.S. government, 26% to a technology company, 27% to a nonprofit, 29%. So in conclusion, unless you can basically guarantee perfect privacy and accuracy, which I don't think anyone can, um, with no leaks to employers, no leaks to the government, etc., only about a third of the population will consent to these apps, according to this study. And then in terms of demographic variance, the researchers note that those who identify as Democrats are nearly three times as likely as those who identify as Republican uh, to be willing to install an app with privacy risks. Finally, those who are younger and women are more are less likely to report that they would install an app with privacy errors. So if you're a young person or a woman, you're not going to risk it um, or you're more you're more likely to say, I'm not going to risk it. Um, meanwhile, in the land of reason, there was a great article published on the same day, actually, as the one about Balaji by Alex Gladstein, um, titled COVID-19 and the normalization of mass surveillance. Um, it's a really great article. I'm not going to read the entire thing because I've already talked about this story a lot already, but, um, he begins by saying like the idea that phone apps should be popularized or even mandated to fight outbreaks is techno utopian. 
based on optimism rather than evidence, the real impact of such an approach on society wouldn't be better immunity, but rather the acceptance and creeping growth of an even more powerful and omniscient global surveillance state. Um, and then at one point he talks about the fundamental flaws with Bluetooth tracking methods, which is similar to the criticisms that we mentioned in episode 215. Um, he wrote that virtually all smartphones run on Android or iOS, uh, or run Android or iOS. More than one third of the world's population can end up in Apple or Google's tracking system. And yet, as of today, few, if any, independent studies prove with evidence that phone uh, contact tracing has, all things being equal, been a significant factor in stopping COVID-19. In Taiwan, public health authorities have said that their mass surveillance strategy combining cell phone location data with user health data was only useful in one case. In Israel, the government recently announced it would stop using phone tracking to monitor quarantine individuals after it wasn't useful. I have to scroll one second. But doesn't Netanyahu also want to put tracking bracelets on children? Yeah, I mean they're 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 moving in that direction, but um, who knows if that if, I, I don't I don't know if that was uh, part of their statement that it wasn't useful. But uh, in, he also notes in Singapore, a city state often praised for its technological prowess, the government revealed even in its own propaganda that phone contact tracing is meant to be at best a supplement for traditional contact tracing and not a replacement. Meanwhile, their omniscient mass surveillance system has failed to stop an ongoing outbreak. Um, and then he also mentioned China has a mass surveillance system, and yet they didn't stop COVID-19. Uh, a recent briefing in The Economist concludes that authorities would only be able to get the accuracy they need to stop COVID-19 by mixing Bluetooth tracking with location data, CCTV data, and communications data which would defeat the privacy-preserving approaches in the first place uh, with an omniscient panopticon. Um, and they says, we must also grapple with the fact that the government with the most intense citizen uh, surveillance system in history, the Chinese Communist Party, couldn't, despite all the Orwellian tech in the world, prevent an outbreak, untold deaths, and economic devastation. In fact, the CCP knew about the danger of COVID-19 outbreak, by late December, but instead of using its enormous spy powers to quash the virus, it decided to try and cover up the outbreak, censor medical reports, and hide evidence. Local officials even ordered the destruction of novel coronavirus samples and arrested whistleblower doctors who spoke up about the danger of the emerging virus. Funny how whistleblowers are always getting the short end of the stick when uh, all these governments are claiming that we need mass surveillance. Um, so before we get too excited about defeating COVID-19 with phone tracking apps and mass surveillance, ask yourself, do we need them and will they work? The answer is no. Wear a mask and wash your penis. Time to go back to work. And now if I want to share that rant, I will have to cut this out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, though. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to hop into this next one and, um, all I'm going to say is <clears throat> Mr. Novak, neener, neener, neener. Um, so Intel and um, Taiwanese uh, Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation um, are both planning to build foundries in the United States. Um, TSMC is literally looking at sites specifically in Arizona and you know, actually planning to make this work. And as well, Intel, um, and I think this, this is kind of a little interesting um, between the lines aspect of this. Um, Intel isn't just looking at establishing a foundry here. Um, they're looking at establishing a foundry in partnership with the Pentagon. And so at least where Intel is concerned, um, between the lines, um, I think that their side of this is not going to be just solely commercial um, fab plants. I think they're also going to be in talks with, with the Pentagon and different intelligence services about producing hardware specifically for the United States government. Because that that is exactly 
the the kind of narrative that's that's really driving the, this notion of bring this type of technological manufacturing home. It's it's not just like you you could have a, a bugged phone from from China. It's oh my god, um, a Pentagon data center could be riddled with exploitable hardware shipped from China, and you know I think both of those are equally important. But it's very clear that from the government's point of view, um, one thing is a lot more important than the other. And so I think it's it's kind of you know important there to, to look at that distinction that between Intel and TSMC, um, Intel is actually looking for a partnership with the Pentagon in the development of some of the, the facilities they want to build here. And so that's a dynamic here to consider. But... You know, I think this would be a fucking epic thing. This has been a very big concern of mine for more than a decade. It's, it, you, you can't have one country who does a lot of shady shit with all the other countries um, building the world's computing hardware. Um, that should spread around and localize a little bit more. And yeah, um, it's happening. And, uh, you know, once we get those chips over here, um, I would like to announce Shinobi's impending um, candidacy for president of the United States 2024 um, slash the minimum wage so that we can get devices assembled here, too. And I can go suck it, Rodolfo. Eh. <laughs> All right. Well, I just hop into the uh, next one. <laughs> yeah. All right, so this is pretty awesome announcement from Lightning Labs. Um, the recent uh, 0.10 um, LND release uh, brought multi-path payments uh, support to LND. Um, so this update to Lightning Loop um, has integrated that to take advantage of that in the loop in and loop out services. Um, so now that this support exists, um, there is no limitation as far as a single on-chain transaction to a single channel in using Loop. Uh, it is now simultaneously possible to empty multiple Lightning channels into a single on-chain um, Loopout UTXO. And th this actually is uh, atomic, unlike a regular multi-path payment where you are just incentivizing the receiver um, to only release the pre-image after the whole payment gets there um, because you are um, the endpoint of the other payment as well as the initiator. <clears throat> it literally is atomic. Um, you're in control of both sides of that. And you can also um, loop in now. So you could use a single UTXO on chain in a single transaction to top off any number of existing lightning channels you have. So a single UTXO, a single input output transaction um, could fill up 20 lightning channels if you have 20 lightning channels all in that one operation. And so like th this multi-path support actually getting into the, the protocol now has these massive compounding benefits for the atomic interaction between on and off chain as well. You know, previously in the original loop beta, um, if you wanted to top up a channel, you had to make a single individual on-chain transaction for every individual channel you want to top up. If you wanted to pull the balance of a channel on-chain, you had to get a single individual UTXO for each individual channel that you emptied on-chain. And now you can atomically link that without any kind of required symmetry on that side. And so this is, this is fucking awesome. And to go along with this, they've also upped the limit um, that they have on using the loop service to 0.1 BTC. And so like th this, this right here, just this, this application of multi-path payments to this interaction point of on and off chain, I think um, actually has more compounding benefits than just multi-path payments themselves on Lightning in terms of the scalability of Lightning. And so this is pretty fucking awesome to see. And uh, yeah, keep those channels open. 
Mm-hmm. All right. So what is up next? How much am I going to want to call somebody stupid? Uh, I mean, don't know yet because we don't have that much information. But basically on May, May 11th, Zuko announced the Zcash Developer Alliance saying today six companies made up of skilled builders are leaning in to make that a reality the reality of apparently Zcash helping people get economic freedom, something, and to help determine the future of Zcash itself. Uh, the attached page that he linked to on the Zcash, Zcash website says, quote, participating ZDA, uh, Zcash Developer Alliance organizations in 2020 include Agoric, Bolt Labs, Consensus, Eclusion, IQ Illusion, I think it's Eclusion, Cyber Network, Thesis, and Electric Coin Company. Um, ZDA members are invited to in-person developer summits twice a year in addition to quarterly conference calls. The initial focus of this group is to develop cross-chain interoperation with top-tier mainnets, and the strategy and agenda of this alliance will be set by its members. Um, Interestingly enough, the the, uh, foundation for Zcash was left out of this membership. Um, there's also a personal quote from Joseph Lubin on the page where he says, I'm excited for consensus to join the ZDA to further promote collaboration between the Ethereum and Zcash ecosystems and advance R&D, particularly in the fields of interoperability and privacy. It feels like it's time for a Zcash Ethereum bridge. Um, yes, uh, an Ethereum bridge for your money to flow into Zcash because, um, yeah, Founders Award gone. No more funny money. Uh, they also published the notes from their first meeting, which you can check out. It's linked on the page. Not much really happened. Um, in a statement to Coindesk, Occlusion founder Zaki Manayan said that the Zcash anonymity set is a valuable public good, describing how the privacy coins, uh, how the privacy coin allows shielded tra- transactions and the construct that allows individual transactions to get lost in the metaphorical crowd. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. What what anonymity set? Um, I wasn't able to find an updated figure for what percentage of transactions on Zcash are shielded, but according to a 2017 paper titled On the Linkability of Zcash Transactions, they found that only about 3.5% of all Zcash coins are controlled by shielded addresses on average. So I don't see how you can market your anonymity set as this product or service that's valuable when you don't really have one. Also, what about that whole vulnerability that we talked about in episode 193, where until seven months ago, if you use shielded addresses, you could uh, have them be IP linked to your Zcash node due to a bug. Oopsie. Um, In terms of the work related to Bitcoin, um, the only Bitcoin company in this list is Bolt Labs, and they said that they'll be working on a Zcash-inspired testnet for Bitcoin called ZK Channels, so basically zero-knowledge proofs for the Lightning Network, um, though this won't be available until 2021. Uh, And there's a paragraph talking about how apparently they expect merchants to open tens of thousands of channels basically open many 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 channels so that they can um protect the privacy of their customers which is you know fine i figured that zero knowledge proofs were eventually going to be added to lightning um but then at the end of the day uh the article also says despite the zda's cypherpunk roots this is still an industry alliance focused on business not rebels no surprises there considering Zcash is still part of the blockchain alliance, which is literally just, I'm willing to bow to law enforcement group. Hey guys, I made a new job for myself, you know, because I still need to buy groceries. Yeah, grocery tax. (laughs) I mean, it's just like, oh my God, I, I don't even know where to start. Like, you said it all. Anonymity set? What anonymity set? Like, what are you guys doing here? Pride, like, you're full of shit. Like, and like, yeah, and like anything useful in terms of application for um, lightning of zero knowledge proofs. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, whatever is actually translatable to Bitcoin without changes we can't get is totally going to happen eventually. But like, 
wow, I can't think of anything else except maybe you might get a new thing added into lightning out of this. Is that, is that the sum of potential value that they could be adding to this space? I think, I think I got that right. That that's it. Right. Yeah. And funnily enough, I mean, I, I didn't quote significant portions of the article. Most of it was about how they're super excited to plug into cosmos. I'm just like, okay, <laughs> don't give a shit. <laughs> what? They're going to deepfake edit Zcash into a Carl Sagan series? <laughs> uh, that would be so much cooler <laughs> than the reality, but no. It's fucking shitcoin, devs. Like, seriously, it's, it's just... Just fucking go work on Bitcoin. Okay, go go fucking work on Bitcoin. If, if you had just, just bought some Bitcoin and just held it, you would have money to just go work on Bitcoin. Also, I, I, I just realized before I started the story that I think that a lot of the incentive for these different shit coins to be all like, let's do interoperability is so that if any one of them goes down, they don't have to feel sad and feel like they've betrayed the, the, the idiots that were stupid enough to buy into their coin. They can just be like, oh, don't worry. Just move over to this other thing. It's interoperable. Just move over there. It's like a safe. It, they're just basically building a safety net for themselves and they're calling it interoperability. Yeah, uh, that makes it. Ah, man. It's an escape hatch. Yep. Alrighty. Cross so. the Zcash Ethereum bridge before it burns. <laughs> Don't listen to the trolls under the bridge. Go from one burning island to another. Alrighty, though. Uh, I'm sure the, the, la the last bur burning island will be somewhere in Animal Crossing. <laughs> Alright, though. Alright. Let, let, let's, let, let's get into something that has been triggering enormous amounts of people um yeah th this, yeah. this 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 confuses me um so, so triggering that you put re in the title <laughs> so uh light night the uh lightning network powered um kind of fortnite um game that's been in development for a while now announced um game items being tokenized on the liquid blockchain and um, this this came to my attention uh, because Marty Bent um, just tweeted out, "Oh no, what do what do I do?" Um, and I, I I don't read his newsletter, the Bent, like every day, but I I do like glance at it, and if I think it's something you know interesting, I haven't seen yet, or Marty's gonna have a a good take on it, I'll, I'll read that one. And I hadn't read um, that days, <laughs> so I was just like, "What?" like what did you do marty um well what marty did was just cover the fact that light knight is tokenizing items in the game in a very skeptical tone where he a few times i think just said he thinks personally this is stupid and isn't gonna go anywhere um and got a bunch of shit for that and it just um boggles my mind um grow up just grow up, everybody. Um, and yeah, I'm going to fucking lay out a case for why this is actually not stupid. Um, because you can apply all the same types of second layers um, with, with some caveats and limitations um, to NFT tokens on liquid that you can to Bitcoin on liquid. You can really scale that. And Here's the potential reason I see why. Um, and the people I see screaming at this, um, I just have to say you are a poser fake ass gamer. So go shut the fuck up now. Um, you don't know what you're talking about. But see, a big issue with the game is I'm just putting my time into it to get made up things that are just ones and zeros in some hard drive somewhere to feel gratified to earn something with my time, to just have a, 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 hey, that, look at that. I, I got that. I earned that. This is why I think that most of the places people try to apply Bitcoin micropayments in games are going to fall flat on their face 
because that is why gamers are at war with half of the gaming companies right now because they're doing that everywhere and we fucking hate it but the micro payments and money gouging aside that server goes off there I don't, I don't have the thing that i earned with my time like it's a stupid one and zero it's in a database yeah but i earned that I, I want that because I earn that with my time. That's why I'm playing the game. And tokenizing those important things in a game beyond the control of that company that can just delete that. Or I'll just give a bunch of them to other people for free. And I'm going to get pissed off because all of these idiots running around with the thing just got it for free. They didn't do shit. I put my time into this. And I don't care anybody listening who, who's just thinking I'm being a, a man child um, in a credibly immature way. Um, that's a gamer. That's what this is. That's the mentality. And there is actual utility in having that thing that I earned outside of some central company's control. And it's not just so, not solely just so I can have that thing to point at. But think about the dynamics of that, of an item that can just be printed out of thin air, given to somebody who didn't earn it in the sense of put time into the game. Um, all the ways that a central party can fuck with that. And then just think about, I can take your game client, tweak it, write a server client, and now when the company says, I'm for this super bad fuck you we're gonna go play on this server now we're gonna take all our items and go over here and there's no coordination problem there is no well wait a minute is that guy running that server gonna give everybody like the items they had how do you prove to him that you really had that item on the official there's that's logistically impossible this type of thing opens that door as a real possibility a possibility that your user base could just pick up one day and just fork your game and go fuck you. And they actually have a point to coordinate that in a way where a lot of them might go do that. So that actually does have a way to check those companies in terms of doing idiotic things that piss off a lot of their fucking user base, a lot of their hardcore user base just to milk the, the casuals for money and as a gamer um i i see that as fucking awesome i see that as a seriously fucking awesome thing and i want to see gaming start moving in that direction because frankly um, most game companies these days are money grubbing cocksuckers that just put out nothing but absolute garbage that they can fucking milk for the most amount of money they can i barely play games anymore because of that I'd like to play more games that don't suck. And this is a dynamic that might actually incentivize getting us there again. So, yeah, you might think this is stupid. You're wrong. You might think this isn't going to go anywhere. It might not. But we're going to see, motherfucker, because if I can get good video games again, I'm going to fucking get good video games. Suck it. Are you sad that you lost your job and no longer have an income? We have a solution for you. You can play this game and earn more imaginary money. But wait, now, hey, guess what? You can trade that for real money! And the company can't stop you. Yeah, um, I'm just going to note there that that's another aspect that could actually create gainful employment for people without a company running a game being able to stop them. And I'm just going to stop there. Or I'm going to keep ranting for like the next five or 10 minutes. So what you're saying is I can get a job in Animal Crossing. Yes, you can. Or Minecraft. Yep. Welcome to the future. All righty, though. Um, so another awesome thing. I'm uh, just going to kind of touch on this quickly. Um Crypto Garage, um, a subsidiary of the Japanese company Digital Garage, um, dropped a tutorial in constructing discrete log contracts 
as well as um, two libraries for them, um, one in C++ and another for JavaScript and TypeScript, a uh, kind of a version of JavaScript that's a little less crazy. Um, but yeah, so there there is actually now libraries and deployable code, at least in a test environment, to start playing around with what you can actually do with discrete log contracts. And I'm, I'm really interested to see where this goes because kind of the uh i don't know the the make or break in this in my mind is like how closely you can emulate traditional financial products with this kind of smart contract and then how well can you balance the new positives it brings versus the drawbacks um to really kind of draw actual capital into these types of mechanisms for financial products because i really do see the potential that this just starts eating in the long term you know the bigger bitcoin gets um traditional ways of doing certain types of derivatives because as, as long as there is not the need to literally be tossing something around uh, by the microsecond there's really a lot you can do in terms of you know, financial products with on-chain smart contracts like this that could actually produce a lot of value, like a lot of shit that happens on over-the-counter desks um, could be done in a much more trust-minimized way through smart contracts like this. And so, yeah, I kind of am going to be keeping my eye to the ground over the next few weeks and seeing what kind of cool stuff people hack together with this because I, I'm not just interested in gobbling up PayPal and Visa. Um, I want to see Bitcoin gobble up the entire financial world and this is part of that. Alrighty. Um, oh yeah, 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 this. Sorry, had to take a second and remember what was next up. Um, I think just two more stories to go. This um, is out of order. This no. should have been up by the hash rate. No. Um, yeah, probably should have. Oh, well. <laughs> um, so FTX um, has dropped hash rate futures contracts. And anybody who pays attention to Jack Mahler's um, has probably been thinking about this for a while. Um, but there is actually a contract with a specification out there now from FTX. And this is, this is fucking cool. This is going to go down in the history books as a big moment in terms of the maturing financialization of this space. So, um, Pretty much what this is doing um, is denominating a single contract that is priced um, pretty much by taking um, the difficulty and dividing by a trillion. Um, so you would get, and, and it's, a, it's a little more complicated than that, um, depending on for what purpose and over what time horizon you're pricing it. Um, like they would average out um, during a quarter for the actual settlement price. Um, but the idea is dividing by a trillion um, right now um, with the difficulty at 16 trillion gives you um, 16. So that would be a single contract of this um, is $16. And then say the difficulty goes up to 18 trillion while well, a single contract would appreciate by two dollars and kind of the whole um logic behind this um financial product is is giving miners a way to hedge against the difficulty going up which is going to increase their operating costs and so that's a natural um you know, participant on one side of this, the long side, um, anybody mining is going to want to be long the difficulty because as the difficulty goes up and their costs go up, um, they're profiting from the long on the, the hash rate futures. Now, I actually had a little interesting conversation um, in the den the other day um, about who, who exactly is going to take that other side. Um, who would want to short, uh, <laughs> you know, 
uh, the Bitcoin mining difficulty. And kind of the, the consensus the room landed on was that, uh, you know, initially um, the first group of people who are going to want to do that are just idiots um, who think Bitcoin is going to die uh, mining death spiral. Um, and that that's probably going to be the first group of people who would want to jump in and take the short side on this product. But then beyond that, um, you know, just thinking about how constant the demand to be long with a product like this is from miners, um, you know, I think it would naturally trade at a premium because every miner is going to want to be long this to actually have um, their cost counterbalanced. Um, but, you know, besides the idiots um, who, who just think the mining dust spiral is going to happen, um, you know, with this premium on the hash rates, um, if you thought Bitcoin's price was going to go down um, and not just a short blip, but like actually go down, well, that would be an instance in which the mining difficulty would go down. And so you could actually use this product to kind of indirectly um, short the price of Bitcoin. And then in the real long term, um, my thinking on who would really have the kind of long term incentive to be short on a hash rate futures the way that miners um, have a massive incentive to be long is uh, power utilities. Pretty much any um, electric company that had a relationship with large miners, it would be in their interest to be short um, this hash rate futures or a, a, a contract like this. Because the idea is if the hash rate goes down and miners start unplugging, well, that electric utility is probably going to lose some of the, the customers buying their electricity and they're going to lose money. And so being short on this contract, if that happened, would balance that out. And so, like, I think, you know, this is something Jack has been talking about for a long time. But, you know, here's the first actual instance of a hash rate futures. And I think this is going to be really fucking awesome going forward. And, you know, whether you like it or not, I think this is going to be uh, looked back at in the same light as the first Bitcoin futures being launched. Like, this is... This is a huge moment in terms of this market maturing. Mm -hmm. was, that, was that in relation to the stock to flow conversation that they were having during the TFTC? Uh no, no, it's um whatchamacallit. The, the, I, I was saying um this is like a conversation we had in here uh the other day. Uh somebody uh, actually came in and kind of showed me that this launched, and so we all uh Spent like an hour or two talking about it. All right. So last story of the day. This. Don't be mean. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to be mean. I'm just going to be an asshole. No, don't be that either. <laughs> but, um, so the charlatan, um, I believe formerly from shift Grippo, um, disclosed a potential uh, supply chain attack uh, with the cold card. And how do I put this? Um, this is a real issue. Um, it's something that can be easily mitigated um, simply by just wiping fresh firmware on a device that you receive um, new from the factory. And while he does have an argument that theoretically um, it could be attacked in a way where even flashing new firmware um, on the device um, does not fix the potential problems this could create. Um, he was not able to actually demonstrate that. And so I want to just say chiefly that, you know, this ultimately is a supply chain attack that requires somebody to compromise a device before it gets to you. Um, and that's going to be possible in one way or another with literally everything. But the gist of this is that um, with the cold card, you are able to run unofficial firmware. 
um, with a public key um, that they have literally released the the private key for um, that's burned into the the cold card along with CoinKite's um, factory key to validate firmware. But if you load firmware on the device, um, it will flash the first time the red warning light, um, and that will not go away until you actually enter the PIN and authenticate, after which um, the device will no longer flash that red warning light um, that it's not running um, CoinKite signed firmware on the device. And so pretty much what um, Charlatan was able to do is go in with a device um, which you are not supposed to be able to reset the master pin on. And he was able to go in and wipe that with custom firmware to zero. Um, and then pretty much this allowed him to go through, um, initialize this device, um, load custom firmware and authenticate so that the warning light stopped flashing but then able to reset the master pin to zero with that custom firmware, um, which then causes the device to um, go through the initial setup process. And so pretty much you could um, have a device show up that would have the matching number of the factory bag, um, which you would still have to compromise and or, or just completely replace in some way. Um, without tampering signs that would not flash the warning light that there is unofficial firmware on it. Um, and you could make the device do, you know, a lot of things. You could literally just have it put your keys when it generates a wallet file or something like that. But this can be solved um, by just reflashing the firmware yourself on the device when you get it. Um, do that, you're fine. And now where this kind of is getting into the area of stupid drama, in my opinion, um, Charlatan is arguing that you could have a very bare bones um, firmware much smaller than the actual full firmware um, installed on the device that would not be overwritten and would still operate even after you install the firmware yourself fresh after receiving the new device and that flashing the firmware yourself would not mitigate this issue now theoretically yes that's possible but in reality in his attempt to do so he bricked his device um, so he was unsuccessful in the first attempt to do that. And this is kind of a common theme. Um, you know, Salim has made comments, uh, Salim Rashid, um, a few times along these lines as well, um, that while trying to compromise a cold card, um, he bricked it. Um, well, if you brick the device rather than pulling off the, the theoretical thing you are attempting to do, you didn't compromise the device. You failed. That isn't to say that what is being attempted is literally impossible or could never be done, but you did not succeed in doing it. You did not prove definitively that this is possible, even though it is soundly theoretically so. And I'm just frankly kind of getting sick of having to disentangle this kind of drama and argument over bug bounties and stuff every time an issue comes up with a hardware device. Um, like, yes, having that very bare bones firmware that would not be overwritten um, in a firmware flash is theoretically possible. But the first attempt to demonstrate that failed. So take that for what it's worth. Um, in response to this, um, CoinKite is now actively in their um, set up the cold card page, um, recommending users rewipe the firmware themselves um, from scratch to deal with this issue. Um, and he, um, they put out kind of some thinking about how to deal with this um, or these kinds of issues uh, more soundly. And what Charlatan was pushing for is locking down the cold card so that it cannot run unofficial firmware anymore. Um, and 
coin kites attitude and i agree with them is no that is unacceptable um this is my device and if i could not run whatever firmware i decided to run on this on this device um i, I might not have this device i have this device because it is sound and open and i can do what i want with it um so i don't see that as a tenable solution um CoinKite is in the process right now of actually getting higher grade security bags, um, which they're going to start using soon for shipping the orders. Um, a potential solution, um, literally um, parentheses, no way um, in the CoinKite blog post at the title of it was tracking bag numbers um, and adding another authentication um, phase to things so that a customer could track things to their um from the factory to their home and verify that as well um they're refusing to do that because right now um there is nothing in the invoicing or record systems for coin kite that actually ties a hardware device identifier or a bag id to somebody's order and they do not want to create those connections um as well, um, he they're kind of thinking about the USB um, port that you actually power the device through, having a um, kind of a snap tab that would cover that, that you have to physically snap off um, to actually use the device, just to have another um, physical check when you receive it. But um, they're they're kind of hesitant to go that way because that would prevent them from doing a final um, software check on the device before things are bagged um, and put into inventory um, because once the case is sealed you know that tab would be blocking the port to power it on and then they also tease at the end um next gen um the potential of using more than one secure element in a hardware architecture and so, you know, ultimately, I think this this is a, a potential issue. Um, you know, the the possibility of a bare bones, um, very minimal firmware surviving a, a firmware reflash. I mean, yes, that's theoretically possible, but the attempt to demonstrate that failed. And it, it's really, I just, I would like to see when it comes to pen testing and assessing the security of things like this, if it can just stop being a pissing contest and can, can it just be a discussion about the facts? Like, please. All right. And on that, that note, that was very not meany of you. Yes, Mostly. it was. I'm an asshole. Fuck you. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think that pretty much wraps us up for the day. Um, so, final thoughts? So, my final thought is just to give an update, uh, a few updates on the Assange case. The first one is that um, you, I don't know if I mentioned it yet in a final thought, but the extradition trial has been postponed to September 7th due to the ongoing lockdown situation in the UK and the inability for not only even lawyers, representatives to appear in court, um, but also because members of the public have a hard time attending the proceedings, which is an important thing for a public trial of this significance. Um, the other thing, really interestingly, there was an investigation published by thegrayzone.com by Max Blumenthal um, about the connection between UC Global and Sheldon Adelson in terms of the spy operation against Assange while he was in the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, so you can find that at thegrayzone.com. I believe it's titled The American Friends New Court Files Expose. Uh, Sheldon Adelson's involvement, something along those lines. Very, very long, very good piece and, and interesting about, um, I mean, it, it's it's something, I don't know if there's been any other examples that have been publicly exposed, but it's long been suspected that when, you know, intelligence agencies are targeting someone, they usually try to put 
layers of companies, whether those companies are actually independent, real entities that do things or whether they just create, you know, they just create fake companies um, just for the specific purpose that they're using them for in terms of spying in order to create this kind of buffer where if, you know, if an operation goes bad, maybe it will only be exposed that it was tied to that, you know, those actions were tied to a specific company. Um, so this is a really interesting example of that happening. Um, the other update is that, um, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but his last name is Bolstrom. Bolgstrom. He's basically a Swedish politician slash women's advocate. Um, and he died, I think, yesterday from coronavirus. And if you aren't familiar with the Assange case, you may not recognize his name, but he was basically the guy who, when, um, when the allegations against Assange were initially dropped because um, the police department in Stockholm found that there was no substance to the allegations, and in fact, the allegations from the women didn't actually mention rape, had nothing to do with rape. Um, apparently this guy was the one who kind of, I don't know if there was pressure involved, but he basically, um, he basically nudged Marion Nee, who was the prosecutor who took over for most of the time that Sweden then continued to pursue the case after it was reopened. He was the one who kind of, you know, nudged them to keep it open and turned it from, you know, one of the women wanted him to get an HIV test to this woman alleges that he um, sexually assaulted her. And so he was kind of the source of that whole confusion that the media has uh, basically swallowed whole these many years um, that this has been going on, that there was you know, actually allegations of rape or sexual assault when it was actually about getting an HIV test. And yeah, he is now dead from coronavirus, which if you think about it, um, dead people are a lot easier to FOIA. So it's possible in the next couple of weeks or months, we may find out whether there was uh, more to his pressuring the Swedish prosecutors than we know about. That'll be interesting to see. Uh, yeah, I, I don't really have any thoughts today, except uh, I finally watched Waco, um, and you should go watch it so you can get really pissed off again like I am. Um, also, wear a mask. Wash your penis. Catch you later, punks. Triggered. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>